As CEO of LifeWorks Systems, I know that you as business owners and senior executives are concerned about the well-being of your organization. Your business is here to fulfill an important role in the community. And not only are you concerned about delivering quality products and services, you also carry the responsibility to make sure that your revenues are increasing, your people are fully engaged, and that you're creating the conditions that attract and keep top talent. This is an executive briefing on consciously creating a culture of excellence. One of your concerns is managing complexity and advances in digital technology. Today's agile digital solutions must be mapped to equally agile workforce behaviors in which all team members can both lead and follow dynamically with confidence. That's needed in order to meet today's requirement for collaboration and fluidity. Another concern you have is how to manage diversity of thought and experience. This can be seen in the uninterrupted struggles within people, such as stress, depression, addiction, and the struggles between people, such as righteousness, racism, genderism, and ageism. The glue that holds us together in the future must include a human system framework that brings about unity and appreciation for differences so that they become the impetus for creative solutions. Another concern you have is people, your greatest asset, including how to attract, develop, engage, and retain top talent. As more businesses hire people across different time zones and locations, working on multiple projects and using various mediums, organizational design must evolve to accommodate a more fluid work stream. Matrix structures must replace linear hierarchies because people will succeed primarily on how well they collaborate with both internal and external networks. And most important is your need to stay relevant and competitive. What once took decades now takes months or even days to create and implement. Just look at Uber and Lyft, overnight scalable sensations that surface so rapidly and so globally that we're all reeling from the impacts. Emotional and social intelligence must be cultivated in order to favorably impact current and future trends when the only certainty you can count on is uncertainty. When automation and artificial intelligence and robotics replace traditional jobs, the kinds of organizations that will thrive are those in which each person manages their relationships, their productivity, and their engagement using a shared power human system framework that creates stability despite rapid change. So I love this quote because I see so much information focusing on the trending right now, which is moving away from the command and control ways of running a culture to more of a shared power, decentralized authority, and self-governing. And yet most organizations kind of look at those facts, see those success stories, and still have that idea in their head, well, that's great for them, but we're okay over here. And so they really don't have that determination to recognize what all of that means and how important it is for them to be decisive about going out of their way to do something different. And it comes from this that denial that says, well, I can't see myself as irrelevant. I can't see my approaches as outdated. And that pride or that fear of being wrong is actually keeping many organizations stuck, keeping many organizations from moving forward into the future confidently and successfully. Einstein had it right when he said, if you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And I know people refer to this quote as the definition of insanity. And yet, that's what I think is so important to recognize around change blindness. If we don't recognize cause and effect between what kinds of decisions, conditions, and conversations we create and tie those to the effects of those, we'll keep doing that formula for insanity. He also said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. And that's why it's so key that people understand the difference between control-based 
operations, control-based culture models, and responsibility-based culture models. So the very systems that we have been relying on for centuries now to get the results we want are no longer the thinking we want to use to overcome those problems. So a lot of people don't really make that connection that the control models themselves are causing the lack of self-control within their people. I'm going to end this executive briefing with three small videos. The first is from an organization that went through a culture transformation, and it's speaking on the importance of giving everyone the same kind of tools, concepts, and practices as the senior team and the executives. What is typically done in organizations is that it's only those people that receive that leadership development training and coaching and ongoing mentoring. And in reality, what's really important is that everyone have that information and those practices simultaneously as an entire community. It's hard to measure the efficiency that we've gained from having a common set of tools, but I know that it's saving us time in meetings, troubleshooting issues quicker. I really think it's super important that everyone's included in there and in the process and the um, teachings, um, mentoring sessions. We really can prompt each other for gaps if we start to go along a tool and somebody says, oh, well, will you do it this way or you forgot that piece or that was perfect and we can support each other. And there's no secrets at all. It's all out there. There's nobody that's the keeper of the knowledge or you don't have to get to the next level. Everybody's included. It's more equal that way. If everybody knows what we're working on doing, then they understand that we're trying to improve them, number one. Not only that, they're, uh, they understand when I say something, there's a framework and a language that I can use that we, we have a common understanding of. The next video is an example of what the end game looks like. When you have an entire workforce who is owning the culture model and is taking responsibility for the employee hiring, their orientation, taking them through the culture change, training online modules, the group review sessions, the mentoring sessions, and it becomes this self-perpetuating culture model that everyone in the environment is responsible for. The employee leader is any employee who has completed that at least that first 12 months. An orientation candidate is simply a person who starts in January or comes in after January and is going to be onboarded. And an employee leader could be also an orientation candidate. Some of you guys did that in your first year on board, you also stepped up to the plate and said, I want to teach it while I'm learning it. That way we can kind of both Jump interject in. at the same time. Do you find that you're getting good response to this process that you're doing? Yeah, we, yeah, the response and just the class, just everyone um, participating was good. We good. sit down, we go through it, kind of rough draft, and then we, go through it one more time to kind of finalize what we're going to talk about. Okay. And then we actually go through the modules and role play what we're going to say. And you do this with a, a co-partner? Okay. They actually will look through it ahead of time and maybe um, make a point, hey, we need to talk about this key point a little more. Yeah. Um, you didn't bring your binder with you. What was your reason for that? Okay, that's not going to help. What can you do in the future to make sure that you... You're, you're heading the right way, but what future are you talking about? The next time we meet, too too long. <laughs> so do you guys see? See, I want you guys to see this because this could become an ongoing cycle. Did you bring your uh, your? It just got real form and have it filled out. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, so I, what I want is I want you to do that by Friday, like this is Wednesday, and I'd like you to do that by Friday, um, and make sure that you get a copy to me. Are you willing to do that? Yes. I have an answer here, but I want to hear what you guys think. I don't see how it's different than any other. Mm -hmm issue that they would be having, whether it's with management or without. So one of the things you talk about is when you have an issue with somebody, that you talk about the issue and not really focus on the person. Right. Um, and so then you can really focus on the issue and then work through the issue itself. How to resolve it, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. That's something you learn it so much more than when you're just on the receiving end of it. And imagine if Erin was trying to do this without your help. It would be insane. She wouldn't be able to do it. And imagine how good it will feel when you guys get to the day where you can mentor Erin if she needs it. Because this isn't about I'm above you and I know more than you. 
This is about I'm here to support you and make sure you're well onboarded and you're well tooled. And then it's all about helping each other. So don't even hold yourself in this box of I'm only a, an employee leader to this person. And even if they hire somebody here that's higher on the chain, you know, from title, you can still mentor them. How it impacts everybody as a whole. And the best way I learned something is teaching. So it just makes me more immersive and rather than receiving it, I'm also giving. And then the very last video that you'll see is the perspective of a CEO who turned around multiple multi-million dollar debt in three different hospitals. And the last one, he turned around over $30 million. But what he found was that because he didn't have a systems approach that was effective in transferring responsibility to everyone on the team, he wasn't able to sustain the positive changes. Every time he would leave one of those hospital systems, his hard work would reverse. And so here's that is the final video, which is just offering a perspective of someone who has been through it all. Employees are attracted to your organization because of the work environment that you create for them. People leave organizations for a variety of reasons, but the majority of the time it's because of their work environment and the relationship with their immediate supervisor. And what having a system in place does is allows everyone to know how to behave, how to act, and how to interact. And one of the things that I truly believe is that we don't fully understand the impact financially on our companies for not having a great work environment. And I believe that that great work environment relates to the relationships of employees to each other and employees to the client. How much better would your organization be financially if your turnover rate was half of what it is today? How much better would your organization be financially if you had lower sick time? People call in sick for a variety of reasons, but in an organization where you really have a top-notch work environment, they don't call in sick because they know the impact that will have on their fellow coworker. And I had been in some organizations where I've made some of those changes, but it really didn't have the formal process in place to really understand that and communicate it to each and every employee in the organization. And if I had, I know my organizations would have done even better financially.